10 top 100 prospects have debuted in the first 10 days of the season. Not a record, but it's close. Why are so many elite prospects hitting the bigs at the same time? Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked On MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer for Sports Illustrated. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Talking about Bet Online, if you followed along when we did the Cy Young, uh, not Cy Young, the Rookie of the Year odds, you saw a lot of guys in there for Rookie of the Year. 10 players in the top 100 have debuted this year. It's not a record. 1995 had 12 guys, but uh, 10 top 100, including four of the top 10 overall prospects in baseball in Bobby Witt Jr., Julio Rodriguez, Spencer Torkelson, and C.J. Abrams. Uh, You would have had more if not for injury. Riley Green, also in that top 10, would have debuted, as well as and the Rutschman, the catcher for the Orioles, had it not been for that triceps injury. So you would have had 12, including six of the top 100, if not for injury. So there's a couple reasons why you can look at why did this happen. Um, you know, because that trend had been going down. Like, if you go back to the, like, the mid to late 90s to now, like 60% less top prospects made opening day rosters every year. And so some of these changes are because of things MLB has deliberately changed. Some of these are just kind of coincidental. So the things that MLB changed. uh, In the new collective bargaining agreement, as part of the service time manipulation um, negotiations, they come up with the Prospect Promotion Initiative. And that is something where they're trying to incentivize teams to have guys on the roster on opening day versus sending them to AAA to hold down their service time, to not give them a year of service time, and maybe even avoid the Super 2 deadline. That's the Pittsburgh Pirates music I'm hearing right here. Uh, So, under the Prospect Promotion Initiative, one of the things that they did is you can get potential draft pick compensation for your rookies. So, here are the rules to get a compensatory draft pick after the first round. One, the guy has to be rookie eligible, and has to be on a top 100 on two of the top 100 prospect rankings. They will take Baseball America's rankings. They will take MLB.com's rankings. That's MLB Pipeline, or ESPN.com. You have to be on two of those three sites as a top 100 prospect to be in this pool. The second thing you have to do is you have to accrue one year of service time as a rookie. Now that's typically around 172 days. It'll be a little bit different this year because the the season started late. But you can do it without making the opening day roster. You just have to be on for almost the entire other time. Uh, the easiest way to do that, obviously, is bring them up on opening day so that they can play all season. Uh, there is a quirk in here. The way that they do the top two vote getters for Rookie of the Year, those two guys, regardless of when they came up, the number one and number two uh, vote getters for Rookie of the Year will also get a year of service time. So it is possible to call a guy up in mid-season, and if he just has the best imaginable season anybody could have, he could end up um, getting a year of service time if he comes in first or second in Rookie of the Year voting. But for the most part, you have to bring him up by opening day or within about 10 or 12 days to make sure they're up and long enough to to, to get that year of service time. And then number three, the third criteria, is they have to win Rookie of the Year or finish top three an MVP or Cy Young award voting. And this is not just as a rookie. It can be any season before they're eligible for for arbitration, they can do the MVP or Cy Young. So you can can get up to three picks per player. You get one pick per year, but you can get up to three per player. So hypothetical, you call up, Seattle calls up Matt Brash. Let's say Matt Brash wins rookie of the year. There's pick number one. Let's say next year, Matt Brash wins the Cy Young. There's pick number two. Let's say in his third and final year before he goes to arbitration, he somehow 
pitches well enough to be the MVP. Been a while since we've had a pitcher be MVP, but let's say it happens. Seattle can get a third draft pick for calling up Matt Brash. So the idea here is you are incentivized now if you have an elite prospect, you're incentivized to bring them up early. Because if they spend the full season, accrue the full year of service time, and then win Rookie of the Year, you get a draft pick. So, you're incentivized there. Um, or you can be the Pirates. You can leave O'Neill Cruz in AAA because he needs to work on his defense, not play him in the outfield, and then call him up in two weeks and let him win Rookie of the Year anyway in the National League because it looks like there's kind of a deficit of guys in the National League as compared to the American. So, that's thing number one. And then thing number two that that they did is they 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 expanded the postseason. So postseason, and MLB expanded this now from 10 teams to 12. And then the wild card matchup is not like is a best of three, the first round of wild cards, best of three and not a one and done. So increasing the field by 20%, giving every team at least two games versus one. Can, might be encouraging teams to go after every win because you may not realize this. A victory in April means exactly the same as a victory in September. There is no difference in your record between losing this game in April and losing this game in September. Those games all count the same. We, we tend to put outsized importance on games towards the end of the season because we're thinking about playoff positioning, we're thinking about the pennant chase, the magic number, and all of that. But um, if, you, if you call up a guy now and he helps you win a game in April, that still counts. And even if he doesn't necessarily help you win a game directly, the experience that they gain may help you win a game in August or September. So those are kind of the two things that, that, it, that MLB has done to incentivize teams to call up top prospects. And then there's some things that have happened that kind of made a lot of guys debut this year. The first one is losing the 2020 minor league season. It's going to take a long time to unpack exactly all of the negative effects on these prospects from not having a 2020 season. There's going to be some guys who never end up getting a chance that may have gotten one if that season existed. Um, You're going to have... like. We can't draw a definitive line and say, hey, these guys are debuting in 22 because the season was lost in 2020. But you can think about it. It's logical to assume that there's players who, with one more year of minor league ball, would have debuted in 21. And instead, they didn't get a season. They had that one last year development in 21, and they debuted in 22. It's entirely reasonable to assume that. We can't draw a direct line. We can't measure that. There's no definitive way to say these eight guys wouldn't have debuted if not for the lost 2020 season, but it's logical. It makes sense. And then to go along with that, I think that we just have to understand that this year, this class of prospects is just unusually good. I mean, like the top five prospects in baseball all happen to be you know, young hitters that all had ETAs of 2022. There's only been one other year when um, the top five prospects were all high upside young hitters. Uh, And shout out to Baseball America for having this. 1994, it was Cliff Floyd, Jeffrey Hammonds, Alex Gonzalez, Carlos Delgado, and Chipper Jones. One through five in the rankings were all high upside young hitters. This season, Three of those top prospects, Rodriguez, Witt, and Torkelson, all made their teams. Riley Green would have made it if he wouldn't have fractured his foot. Adley Rutschman would have made it if he didn't have the triceps injury. So you would have had all five come up again. And it might just be something where you just don't have another rookie class as talented at the high end as this one was. And so it could, you, you just may have a natural kind of dip next year where you don't have as many elite prospects ready to debut. How much of that is because of the lost season? How much of that is because how good this t- this class is? We don't really know, but it's just one of those things where, where there is definitely a a an obvious parallel. We just don't have a way to prove it. But um, I think this year is a little bit of an outlier. I do think a lot of those 
Uh, well, a lot of those factors I talked about in that second half, I do think a lot of those play into this. I don't think you'll see as many debuts next year. Uh, I do think this class is especially talented. But um, undoubtedly, the, the, the initiatives implemented by MLB probably did have on most teams, again, not the Pirates, on most teams probably did have an, an effect as far as calling a guy up right away versus keeping him down for a couple weeks. I gave credit to the Royals for um, for Bobby Witt Jr., but MJ Melendez and Nick Prado are still at AAA Omaha right now. Um, I actually believe one of them is playing the outfield instead of a uh, catcher. So, like, they're they're trying they're they're getting them more experience, but those are two guys that could have made the opening day roster as well. And I think once Carlos Santana, once you realize Carlos Santana's done, Prado may make the roster, uh, get to play first base for the rest of the season. But even there. They called it Bobby Witt Jr., but they could have called more guys up and they didn't. And I don't, I'm worried that seeing 10 guys in that top 100 get called up this year is going to make everybody think that service time manipulation is done with. Where the other Royals players, the Pirates with O'Neill Cruz, we've seen that's not necessarily the case. Teams are still willing to manipulate service time. And in just a minute, I've got a great question about some of the better starts in the minor leagues in week one. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at BetOnline. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. So keep track of all the latest sports developments, league reviews, including the NBA playoffs, uh, the start of obviously our MLB season and all of that. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, live betting, playoffs, esports, casino games, and more. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action because Bet Online is where the game starts. Thank you for making Locked On MLB Prospects your first listen. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Now podcast. This I love, I love this. So as somebody who covers 120 minor league teams, I don't have time to watch every single MLB game. Uh, Locked On Now is a recap of MLB games with analysis from our local experts. It takes you, takes fans through the season like no other network can do. It's a free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can check it out every morning and get a recap of all of the games from yesterday. So love the Locked On Now podcast. But the reason I haven't been able to watch those MLB games is because I've been watching MILB.TV. I've been watching a lot of of these young pitching prospects make their debuts over the last week. And there's a couple really impressive starts I want to tell you about. Uh, So the first one is for High A Lake County. It's Guardians prospect, Gavin Williams. So he's he's a top 10 prospect. I think he's number nine right now for for the Indians, for the Guardians, force a habit. But one of the more impressive starts, uh, fastball, you know, sitting around 95, 96. He touches 98 on it. Uh, He can throw it to both sides of the plate. Uh, He had a slider. He had a curveball. Both of them flashed like plus pitches, good velocity on each one. They were playing the Lansing Lugnuts, and they were not ready for this. Struck out six guys, no hits, two walks, and four innings. Uh, Track the TrackMan numbers, which came across which came over thanks to Baseball America, showed really good vertical break, better than average, a lot of arm side run on the fastball. You love to see it. Uh, the the, the curveball, upper 70s, graded out as plus. The depth on it was plus plus. Uh, a really impressive thing. And if you look at a lot of what was said about him, is the conversation was his, his arm strength and his size, but he needed better control. And being able to watch that fastball land on both sides of the plate and throw both the slider and the curve for strikes, I feel good about uh, Gavin Williams going up the board from 10 to by midseason looking at somewhere like the number seven or six prospect in the system. Just, uh, you know, for, for, for debuting at low A, looked really good. I don't think he's going to be at low A for long. He's one of those guys, and again, we know this. I'm sorry, high A. We we know this. I'm a fan of aggressive promotions. I see him going from high A to double A uh, within probably three or four more starts and getting that challenge of high A. I'm sorry, of, of double A. Another young guy who did well, this one a Dodgers prospect, Maddox Bruns. So number 11 prospect, 12-11 around there for the Dodgers. First rounder last year. And a guy that, I mean, High school out of Mobile, Alabama, uh, looked looked really good with the, with the fastball. 
Uh, sitting 94, 96 could run it up to 97. It had a lot of had a lot of like late kind of heavy life to it. And the big thing there, and again, another thing we've talked about with like with some of these guys is controlling it to both sides of the plate. Had a hard biting curveball late 70s. Get swings and misses on that. Had a good slider. Had a good shape to it. Wasn't as loose as it was. Struck out all three guys in the first inning. Uh, got an infield single, but. For, for the most part, has looked really good. Now he's got two starts on the year, two, four, five ERA, uh, three hits, one run allowed, eight strikeouts, uh, no home runs. So looked really good. Kind of love to see what he did there. And then um, Andre Lara, the right-hander for the Nationals. So not an incredibly long outing, only went three innings. And he's a guy... Uh, Finished up last year at low A after the Complex League. And then back there again. But in their top 10. And really efficient. Uh, got fastball set 95 or so. Um, got swings and misses on the fastball and the slider. Uh, the slider was more kind of like a slurve than a slider. But he could throw it front door. He could throw it back door. Um... Only good, only gave up one hard hit ball, had a couple hits allowed, but only one hard hit ball and got in a jam in the third, got a double play to get out of it. Something and the kind of the trend that I'm noticing here on a lot of these comments that I that I was looking at and watching a lot of these guys is I'm impressed to see the command on a lot of these young pitchers. When I when we get down to to a low A or a high A, you're focusing more on what is this pitcher able to do with his pitches versus how did the outing go? So the stat line may not be exactly what you want. And like, Lara's an example of that. He gave up three hits on the day. One of them was a uh, single right up the middle. Two of them were infield grounders that his infielders could not handle. So you're more concerned about what do the pitches look like? What does the pitcher look like? Can he execute the plan he's trying to do more so than what are the results of the pitches? And it's definitely something where where he's getting, like I said, he's getting swings and misses. Most of the pitches are competitive. Uh, he does get into a jam later, is able to induce a d- double play and get out of it. So making the progress, doing the things he needs to do um, simply because, I mean, he's got everything there to be a front end starting pitcher if he can continue to progress. Uh, I still want to see the changeup do more. Changeup didn't quite do enough, but a thing where, you're, again, you're evaluating what he's doing more so than the outcomes on paper in the stats. And in just a minute, I kind of want to go over a couple guys in the upper minors that had impressive debuts last year as well. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Built Bar. Uh, Built Bars are the protein bars that taste like candy bars and are better than candy bars. So tons of flavors. I've talked about peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, all of that. There's a blueberry muffin flavor, like tons of flavors. All of these, no matter what they are, they're all the bar covered 100% real chocolate. They're most of them 130 calories, 17 grams of protein, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs. So, like I said, tons of flavors being introduced all the time. Go to Built.com, uh, check out the list of regular flavors, recurring flavors, limited time special things. While you're there, use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 at Built. Dot com. So getting up a little bit into some of the some of the the higher levels of the minors, uh, Ryan Cusick, Double A Midland, the Athletics prospect. He was traded uh, along with Christian Pache and Shaylin Lears in the Matt Olson deal. Uh, so drafted by Atlanta out of Wake Forest, big boy, 6'6", 235, big guy, and he was top ten for the Braves. He's somewhere around eleventh or twelfth for the A's now. But um, big, big righty works a lot. Like a, he's a fastball slider guy. So the 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 fastball was mid to upper nineties. The slider was mid to upper eighties. Broke really hard in, um, and and very very polished compared to last time we saw him. Um, struck out eight batters. Had a had thirty either swinging or looking strikes over the five innings. Seven, like 17 of those were, were swinging strikes. And so the big story, the story on Ryan Cusick was big, powerful pitcher, has these two pitches, needs to show better control, 
uh, and needs to needs to show something besides that those two pitches. You know, he had a curveball in college as well. Uh, Changeup isn't necessarily anything to speak of. Um, but again, dominant plus plus fastball. The slider is a lot tighter than it was when he was in college. Um, and then answered some of the questions about the control. Looks more polished. Haven't seen that third pitch yet. I want to see either the curveball come back or the changeup um, look a little better. But the t- those two pitches, including an elite fastball, is worst case scenario, a hard throwing late reliever out of the pen. But still starting, looked really good because the command's better. Just want to see him develop that third pitch. And then one of the better pitching prospects in baseball, George Kirby, the Mariners righty. Double uh, A Arkansas, we talked about him last Friday. That double A rotation is nasty. I've spent quite a few uh, idle, like spare spare hours watching these pitches, like these pitchers from Arkansas. Um, he is now 1-0, 186 ERA in two games. And still a top three prospect for this team. And, like, the whole thing here was, one, could he stay healthy? And then, other than that, like, could he could he control the changeup better? Could he, you know, like, it played down because his control wasn't that great. So, you go in there, changeup looked better. Slider looked better. His fastball was still high 90s, plus plus. That was there. But his secondary pitches are a lot more developed. Uh, he, he, you can tell he feels a lot better about the changeup. Uh, he has better confidence in it. He has better command of it. Uh, he, I, I think it did especially well against a lefty, getting arm side strike. So kind of, I'm not going to say backdooring a changeup, but being able to 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 throw it to a lefty, have it run off the plate, and get them to swing and miss on it. Did really good at that. Most of the time, when somebody did make contact, it was on the ground. He ended up getting 18 swinging strikes, threw all four pitches really well. Very, very good five innings. This is something where, if this continues, I think he's going to be following Matt Brash to the major league level sooner rather than later. Another guy that could debut this year. Um, Thought he looked really good. Uh, The third guy is Bobby Miller, the Dodgers right-hander. So he was at AA Tulsa and came out sitting 99 to 100, attacked hitters. I mean, just four innings, 51 pitches, just fastballs, sliders. He was spotting the slider really well. Uh, It was mid to upper 80s, like 85 to 87. And, you know, one of the top, one of the, uh, the top prospects in this Dodgers system, the big question here for him was like, Longevity. How far can he go? We saw way too many times when you'd have him in there for, you know, like he only, I think last year he finished five innings one time. It's just something where like he had to prove he could, he had the stamina and then the durability. Uh, He had an oblique strain last year, was limited pitch count wise, and then depth, how far could he go? So um, being very efficient, having 51 pitches through four was great. The the change ups look good. He got a total of like 22. Um, swinging or looking strikes. So if he could do that, but he could do this into the sixth or seventh inning, I mean, he's a guy the Dodgers could call up this year. Uh, I expect him to to spend a while at AA Tulsa, get moved to AAA if he's not going to the big league level. Just an absolutely dominant performance from Bobby Miller. And, you know, just that's what uh, the Dodgers need. It's just another elite level player. That's I know we were all thinking it. The Dodgers didn't have enough talent at the big league level. They need another elite level player. Uh, so stay tuned this week. Great week coming up. We've got um, College Ball Tuesday tomorrow. We're talk- We're bringing in a draft expert. We're talking about some of the college hitters in this class. How excited we are that these college hitters, uh, some like the guys who have broken out and who are going to, since there's a lack of pitching depth, uh, you're really going to be drawing hitters from the college ranks early in this draft. Who is going to be up there in the top of that list and who are going to be guys that are drafted high? Uh, and then Wednesday, great conversation coming with Sully of Locked on, ML- of Locked on MLB. Not 100% sure what we're going to talk about yet because that's how Sunny works, but they're always great conversations. So stay tuned for that chat with Sully. But until then, this has been Locked on MLB Prospect. Uh-huh.